everybody, good morning, and welcome to the Introduction to Philosophy and Theory class. My name is Julian, and to my left we have Jeneline, Jen who's going to be keeping us company today. Um, if you're joining us for the very first time, hello and welcome. If you're joining us for the upteenth time, <laughs> welcome back. <laughs> welcome back. Um, it's so wonderful that you're starting your week here with us. Hello, everybody. If you'd like to leave us a comment, please leave us a comment telling us where you're joining us from. Mm -hmm. That always makes us very happy. We know we have students from around the world, which is truly a privilege. So please drop us a comment to let us know where you're joining us from. Mm -hmm. We are currently in Spokane, Washington. And um, yeah, so we're going to be doing a one hour class today. It's going to be an introductionary class designed for beginners, but also enjoyable for people who consider themselves experts. <laughs> um, it's going to be an introduction to Slavoj Žižek and the theory of Žižek. Uh, we've done a lot of Kant, we've done a lot of Hegel in the past week. So it's only fair that today we focus a little bit more on Slavoj Žižek. And we're going to be talking about uh, what Žižek means by perversion. What is the pervert? For Zizek, um, and we're going to relate that to various other theories that he has. Thank you guys for commenting. I see Mexico City, I see Kuwait, I see Toronto, Germany, Brazil, India, Turkey. India. That's Welcome. incredible. Thank Thanks you guys so us. much. Yeah. That's wonderful. Um, yeah, so I think we should just pretty much like launch right in. Mm -hmm. I just want to say for a moment that it's only because of you guys that we actually get to do this. Um, and what I mean by that is that. Um, a year ago, we launched the Patreon, almost a year ago, 10 months ago, and um, through the very generous donations from our patrons, Jenly and I have been able to keep these classes open access and free for everybody anywhere, <laughs> which is really a testament to the fact that you guys have supported us and believed in us and just supported this project. So thank you guys so much. Um, and we're gonna we're gonna keep doing this for as long as we can. So thank you to our patrons, and of course, if you'd like to become a patron and get access to a ton of bonus content for every class, please do click the link in our bio or go to www.patreon.com. Dash Jenlene and Julian. Okay, so we just begin. Let's dive right in. All right, so um, I want to talk a little bit about perversion <laughs> and what it means to be a pervert. Yes. <laughs> Speaking from experience, <laughs> you're gonna say no. It's a it's an interesting question. What constitutes perversion? Right now, Zizek has sort of popularized the idea of using the word pervert and perversion within philosophical discourse um, because he's used it as the title for two of the films, the mm -hmm. Sophie Fine's films. Mm -hmm. And Zizek is basically taking an idea which comes from Lacan, which is what Zizek usually does. And and here's here's basically what the pervert is for Zizek and why it's interesting, and a couple of examples of it. So basically, Zizek says that the pervert is somebody who makes himself or herself the absolute instrument of the other, in particular, the other's enjoyment. In other words, the pervert is someone who says, I'm not enjoying myself on behalf of myself. I am enjoying myself on behalf of you. I am enjoying myself on behalf of the other. And this can be both the big other and the little other. Um, for example, you could say that someone who says that they are the representative of a divine will, for example, you say, I don't want to kill you, but God commands me to kill you. This guy is the ultimate pervert because he's not saying I am killing you. He's not just laying off the blame. He is saying, I'm the instrument of God. I'm the sword of God and I am enacting retribution upon you. This would be a perverted stance for Zizek. But vice versa, for example, one of my favorite TV shows, uh, The Young Pope. Mm -hmm. There's a scene in The Young Pope where a couple of priests gather and one of the priests uh, raises his hand like this and he says, what is it that we do as priests? And he starts like straining with his hand. And then he very dramatically looks into the camera and he says, we give weight to God. That is a perverted stance for Zizek and for Lacan. The idea of giving weight to God of making your own body the vessel of God's presence on earth would be considered perverse. Now, it's important to note here that it's not really a normative statement, right? We're not saying that the perver that perversion isn't the proper enjoyment or that perversion is morally wrong or reprehensible. It's simply about the relationship to the other and the way in which you embody your own self by means of over-identifying with the existence of, in this case, the big other with, with God. Does that make sense so far? Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so we can think of many different ways in which which someone could be perverted in that sense, right? You could say that a politician who says that they represent the will of the people is already taking on a perverted stance towards power. Now it's no longer just, I'm a technocrat who's making the following decisions based on my, I don't know, experience and expertise. Now it's saying, I am simply the vessel of the popular will's manifestation, and as such, I am acting according to popular will. That again is a perverted stance towards political power. Of course, what you can already start to sense here is that there is a certain kind of perversion implicit within power itself. Because power always has to express itself in some particular form, and yet the core of power, unless it is expressed in such fashion, remains empty. And so power always expresses itself through a kind of perverted fashion. But of course, it's not only power that is represented us. It's also desire. Yeah, you were gonna say something. Do you mean? Yeah. Do you mean in terms of how it man? In terms of how power manifests itself, or in terms of how it legitimizes itself? Because we, I mean, it seems like in the context of politics, we haven't talked about a perversion of power, a perversion of politics, mm-hmm. in terms of being uh, someone going in the opposite direction of what norms or expectations were directed. So two things there. Or three things. Mm -hmm. I don't know. First of all, we have this idea that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts Mm -hmm. absolutely. But it should be the other way around, which is that power is corrupted because it derives from the absolute. In other words, power has to be legitimized by some urgrund of power as such. Whether it's the legitimacy of the father in the patriarchal society, whether it's the idea of God in a religious society, whether it's, you know, there's the always some, the the exactly, the, the yeah. people in a democracy or mm-hmm. in a totalitarian system, there's always a kind of external substance that gives rise to the so-called legitimacy of power. Mm-hmm. And so it's not that cow power corrupts absolutely, it's that power is already corrupted within itself by the absolute, mm-hmm. the absolute that has to be filled in. Mm-hmm. It's a little bit like, there's something that David Graeber said that I thought was very interesting. He was talking about the idea of prehistory. And he said that what's so funny about prehistory is prehistory is actually a very long period of time. Prehistory is like three million years. And what's so instead of seeing prehistory as a period within history, as a period of time, which would make no sense, prehistory is simply when the bottom of what we thought history was falls out. <laughs> In other words, we thought that human history started at point X, but then we realized that it's actually way further back. And so that entire Oh, we lost the connection. Uh, Let's see, reconnecting. Let's see if we can get it. And so what happens with prehistory is that prehistory is this, it's not just saying it's what happened before history. Prehistory becomes the unaccountable absolute that underlies the substance, the beginning of history itself, mm -hmm. which is why prehistory is three million years, (laughs) essentially. And so something similar happens with power, right? Is that we have this like, the prehistory of power. We have the the zero sum, the beginning point of the sequence of power, which in a sense cannot be properly inhabited and has to always retroactively be filled in. Now, the second thing that I was going to respond to what you said there was that another example of the pervert, of perversion as such, is, is the person who believes too strongly in a kind of black and white division. For example, between truth and lies. Think about, we just had January 6th, for example, which is the uh, year, a year since the storming of the Capitol here in the United States. And what January 6th led to, I mean, in part this year, was just enormous amounts of mostly liberals saying things like, we have to protect the truth, we have to protect democracy, we have to uphold whatever, right? Mm-hmm. There's this huge like sort of virtue signaling about how important it was to protect this society or whatever. And what I'm trying to point out here is that the person who says that they're the representative of truth, the person who upholds truth in that kind of a pure form as the opposite of lies, mm-hmm. it's precisely that person who doesn't see the central lie of their own position, which is that in a weird way, the ultimate lie is the idea of an unadulterated truth. No? Yeah. Am I going too fast? No, no, I'm with you. You seem troubled. No, no, no? I'm with you. I started thinking about January 6th. I got <laughs> troubled. 
Yeah. The idea that there is such a thing as an un unadulterated truth, which can be distinguished from lies, something which has to be upheld as a principle, that is itself the ultimate lie. And so here's, again, the perverts, the perverts dilemma, the perverts position, which is that as soon as you say, I am the representative of the absolute X, mm -hmm. in this case, I am the justified, righteous representative of truth. At that point, you've already misrecognized the lie within your own position. And so the perverted enjoyment is that instead of overcoming that deadlock within your own life, you've avoided it by transposing it onto some higher authority or ideal. This is also why like the best way, <laughs> the best way to like become a very self-righteous person is to be somebody who actually believes in the rule of law, who actually believes in the idea of like principles, etc. Um, Institutional integrity. And I think the, pa the previous four years have, should have at least taught us that it's not a debate about what is true and what is not true. That's not, that's not a useful discussion. And then the third thing that I was going to respond to you, because yeah. I promised three, mm -hmm. is that, because you were talking about norms. Yeah. The thing about the norm, and this is sort of a like, classic Hegelian insight, is that the norms don't exist until they don't exist. In other words, and this is something you've probably seen in your own political spheres, mm -hmm. people only complain about norms at the exact point that they think the norm has been breached or broken. In other words, the norm, and this is very important in relationship to the idea of law, the norm didn't exist to begin with. The norm is only evoked retroactively at the exact point that you perceive it as lost. And this is also why a norm is distinctly not an unspoken rule. Mm. An unspoken rule is very symbolically codified. A norm is something that you only regret once it has passed. And there's something perverted about norms in that sense, because a norm not having existed in the first place, only being evoked once it has been lost, in that sense, a norm is evoked as this is the thing that should be absolute and that I represent. Mm. In other words, the person who complains about how norms have changed and norms have been lost is the pervert. It's the person who's over-identifying with the higher principle that no longer exists, that in fact never existed, but was embodied supposedly by their own self-righteous <laughs> attitude. And so whenever somebody complains about norms, what they're complaining about is something that, in a sense, is supposed to show how they are the, the last sole representative of said norms. Again, if you believe in that kind of stuff, then you have this false division between what is true and what is false, between what was the norm and what wasn't the norm. And so one of the things that Hegel talks about is that a norm only exists in order to fade away. In other words, once you talk about a norm, you're formalizing something that has already passed. It's already, it's already gone. And you're saying either it becomes codified or it sort of withers away. Yeah. Well, yes and no. If you, you can't codify a norm. Mm. Do you see what I mean? Okay. This would be an impossibility. The mm. norm only presents itself as, oh, this was the norm at the exact point that you perceive it as being gone. Okay. But we don't have to get yeah, too yeah, technical yeah, so, about that. No, yeah, no, you yeah. don't apologize. I think it's a totally good question. I'm <laughs> probably being very, very unclear, and I, <laughs> I apologize for that. Now, how does this help us understand why Slavoj Žižek says that cinema is the ultimate pervert's art? Well, the answer is, cinema for Zizek isn't telling you what to desire. It's telling you how to desire. Now, what's the difference there? If I'm telling you what to desire, I'm simply telling you here is desirable object. Uh, I'll give you an example. If you watch TV, especially if it's a sports game, there will be advertisements that will try to induce you to buy fast food. Hamburgers filmed in slow motion. <laughs> uh, the whole thing is very important. Even in the cinema, it's advertisements for popcorn, etc. Yes, and it's very vulgar. It's very like sort of <laughs> pornographic, which isn't to say that pornography is vulgar, but what makes it vulgar is that no hamburger will ever be this juicy. I mean, it's like positively <laughs> dripping and exploding. And, and like, if you've ever looked at one of these hamburgers in the commercials, they're like kind of like expanding. Like the whole thing <laughs> is like properly vulgar. And, and... It's for me, for example, if I'm lying in bed, I want to go to sleep and I'm watching TV, um, which I know is very poor sleep hygiene. And I see one of these ads, my mouth will start salivating. <laughs> like I get a mouth erection basically because I, I, I've just been triggered. Now, 
this has nothing to do with cinema. There's nothing cinematic here, even though it's shot in slow motion and there's lighting involved. It's not cinematic because it's not teaching you how to desire. It's simply making you desire. It's triggering you. Cinema in that sense is very different. Cinema isn't supposed to just give you the fantasy. Cinema in that sense is not like the Freudian dream. It's not just wish fulfillment. Cinema is teaching you how to dream. There's a very big difference here. It's not saying here's what you should want. Rather, here's how you should be wanting it, which can still have the same result. We still mirror our own interactions depending on what we see on the big screen. But now we identify ourselves as the wanting agents rather than just saying it's on screen. And so a classic example, which will probably make less sense for people who are on the internet, but if you grew up watching cinema as your primary mode of cultural engagement, you learned how to kiss by watching people kiss. <laughs> You learned how to walk and dress and how to comport yourself towards others. In other words, cinema was a guide towards being in the world. And it wasn't saying, here's a how-to, which is the biggest genre on the internet, of course. But it was saying, here's how others do. Others, fantastical actors, etc. And of course, that's the entire point of the how-to genre, which is predominant on the internet today. It's the idea that you're not being told what to want, you're being told how to want and how to live. Which, and fundamentally, this is also the pervert's paradox. The pervert's paradox is that secretly most people want to be the agents of some higher wanting. They want to be submissive towards some, some way of life. Um, people want to know how to live. This is essentially what people do. Not because they want to slavishly follow other people's advice, but they want to exist in that headspace where they're thinking of themselves as someone who is learning how to live. And cinema gives you that satisfaction of temporarily suspending your own life, sitting in a dark room, and enjoying being the person who's imagining how one might live if one were in said situation. Which means that there's a very different element within cinema when it comes to catharsis, sort of the classic structure of, you know, tragedy and art, versus cinema as the pervert's art. The catharsis isn't perverted, because in catharsis, you're simply saying, the other is doing it for me. The other is dying, the other is crying, the other is having this big experience, and now I have thereby also rid myself of it. Whereas within cinema, we have the exact opposite, which is that the other is not doing what I am doing through him or cannot do through him. I am using the other so that I can properly inhabit my own life, my own emotions, my own experiences. In other words, within catharsis, we have the subject, the individual who has these emotions and in a sense is drained of them, those emotions by projecting them onto the other. Within cinema, we have the total reversal of that, which is that the subject doesn't know how to want or how to feel, except when refracted through the feelings and the wantings of the person depicted on screen. Mm -hmm. And so we have a, an inverse relationship between the, the cathartic experience of art and what Jaja calls the perversion of cinema. Again, it's really important to note that perversion is not used as a normative statement. We're not saying that catharsis is a higher form of art and that cinema is a debased version of said art. If anything, you could say that the opposite of true. Cinema is much more honest because cinema confronts you with the emptiness within your own desire. It's only catharsis that gives you the illusion that you have these noble and high emotions to begin with, even though you're secretly being manipulated by the person on stage. By catharsis, Am I going too fast? No, no, no. By catharsis, do you mean theater exclusively or do you mean any cathartic art form? Well, originally the idea of catharsis only relates to theater. theater. But mm -hmm. you could say that it also works in other, in other art forms, mm -hmm. essentially. Mm -hmm. um, if anything, for example, you could say that music remains cathartic. When you're listening to music, you are mirroring and channeling your own emotions, but you're also induced towards a higher emotion. It's mm -hmm. like to listen to a really good song can be like having a really good cry. There's an emotional release that takes place. When you go to the cinema, as much as you enjoy yourself, it's usually not because you're craving an emotional release. Instead, you're actually craving a filling in of what you want the emotion to be of your own life. Mm. Now, I'm not trying to make any generalizing statements about what you experience when you're in the cinema or when you go to the theater. I mean. That, that would be pointless. What I'm trying to point out again is that the pervert's position is specifically the position of saying, I'm inhabiting the, the desire of the other. I'm the pure instrument of the other's will. And what happens within cinema is that you become the instrument of the desire of the cinema. Mm -hmm. It's not that you're being brainwashed, it's that you're learning how to desire. Does that make sense? Yeah. I feel like you're very yeah, skeptical yeah, yeah. today. Yeah, no, 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 no. No, I'm with sleepy? you. I, no, no, I got kind of onto this sidetrack about, like, is that something that's unique to cinema? 
No. It's just that cinema somehow seems to capture it in a particular way or is... I don't know, particularly, like, is it that cinema has more cultural resonance for us than theater does? Well, there's a couple of things to talk about there. Mm -hmm. First, obviously, when you go to the theater and you go to the cinema, what they have in common is their voyeuristic experience. Mm -hmm. Of course, cinema is more voyeuristic than the theater for two reasons. One, they turn off the lights. They turn off the lights, too, in the theater, but you're very aware of the people around you. In cinema, not so much. Secondly, within cinema... Everything is depicted according to the gaze. We literally have the point of view shot. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as a point of view shot within theater. So what happens within theater, and this is the problem that, you know, a lot of modern uh, playwrights were and dramaturgs were struggling with, like Bertolt Brecht with this alienation effect, where he's actually trying to push you out of the experience rather than draw you in, is that the limit of theater is the limit of here's a two-dimensional depiction. Of course, today we have like live broadcasts that can be brought to your cinema, but they're not cinematic in any proper sense. They simply have a zoom and certain minimal editing tricks that they accomplish to, to tell you who's singing or who's, who's speaking, but they're not cinematic in that they don't replicate the gaze in any kind of you know, strictly cinematic sense. When you're watching a piece of theater, you're watching a miniaturette, you're mm -hmm. watching a stage play. Which means that you're already, from the vantage point of the person who's viewing it, you're in a very different position from when you're in the cinema, where it's specifically emulating your gaze. Now, of course, movies aren't shot as point-of-view endeavors. It's not like you go into a movie and it's like the TV show Peep Show, where you just see straight through their eyeballs. Instead, movies are constantly breaking down and manipulating what is a point-of-view. And that's also cinematic technique and cinematic art. Which, one of the funny things about theater, I think this is the question you're asking, is does theater become obsolete once we have cinema? Hmm. And you could argue, first of all, I don't believe that theater becomes obsolete, but you could argue that what becomes obsolete is the idea of realist theater. Hmm. We no longer require theater to tell us a story about the reality that we're in. Instead, theater, through its very two-dimensionality, becomes a sense of rupture. It becomes an anal analogy, it becomes figurative. And so we see the theater as a figuration, as a metaphor for something that we can see in our own life. Hmm. Ironically, of course, for Shakespeare, the most popular Shakespeare quote that you see on like fridge magnets everywhere is the whole idea that, you know, the world itself the is stage. all the world is a stage. <laughs> that can only happen when you're watching theater because you're projecting the staginess on back onto your life. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't have a fridge magnet that said all the world's a cinema. Why? <laughs> Because it already is. We only experience our own life through the desiring gaze that we've learnt through cinema. And so it wouldn't even make sense on a fridge magnet because it's too true. Mm -hmm. It's not clever anymore in that sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. That was really okay. helpful. Does yeah. that help? Yeah, okay. yeah. No, I, mean, really really... Helps. I know that's a bit of a distraction. I'd love to do like more on theater and mm -hmm. film. Um, like when I was a student, I was really into Augusto Ball, um, who had this whole like theater of resistance yeah. and like how you can use that that... So for him, it wasn't about being on stage. It was like having like these events where you essentially like performed something in the street. Mm -hmm. And so for a moment, you couldn't really determine whether it was a performance or not a performance. It's like, imagine a flash mob that isn't designed for virality and YouTube clicks. Instead, it's a flash mob that's supposed to undermine the very idea of flash mob itself. Mm -hmm. The thing about the flash mob is it interrupts completely. You and I have been somewhere in town and suddenly people start dancing, and it's very obvious. There's some often someone with a camera. Like, everything stops because there's a flash mob. What's much more uncanny, and this is something that Auguste de Ball was much more interested in with his idea of the theater of the oppressed, that's what he called it, mm -hmm. was that you would no longer be able to tell what was a flash mob and what wasn't, what was part of the performance, what wasn't. Of course, you can only properly understand how visceral that is if you've lived through the kind of dictatorship that Auguste Bois lived through, in which you could be going about your daily life, and suddenly the police show up and arrest somebody, and they disappear forever, and then everybody goes back to what they were doing before. The ultimate flash mob is the, intelli uh, the intelligence services coming to arrest you in, the, in broad daylight, and nobody pretending like it's a thing because they're too scared to say anything. Mm -hmm. And so you really have to see the theater of the oppressed as a way of highlighting what is already there. It's not saying here we have reality and we're gonna disrupt it with a flash mob. Instead it's saying that the way in which we experience reality is already a kind of flash mob. Yeah. And there's something very vulgar and scary and terrifying in that. And so he's over determining, he's over bringing you to that. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's obvious, right? Yeah, yeah, no, okay. that's a really good example. I don't wanna do too much. I mean, it'd be fun, but like, <laughs> but that's not entirely where we're going. But.
So we're still talking about the idea of perversion mm -hmm. and the idea that perversion is when you like inhabit the other, when you become an instrument of the other. Um, and there's, <laughs> there's like a, I don't know if Shizuk makes this explicit, but there's a link that you, that you have to make. I mean, you can make between the idea of the pervert and the Hegelian idea of instrumental reason. Now, the Hegelian idea of instrumental reason is already a little bit of a paradox because the idea is that if something is instrumental, then it's simply unfolding according to a predetermined path. And if reason, right, rationality, is itself instrumental of a higher order, of an absolute, Hegel isn't saying that we're all just automaton that are following like a predetermined fate. Instead, and this is something that Nietzsche would then later do with the whole idea of amor fati, right, embracing your own fate, is this idea that it's only through rationality, in other words, it's only through the excess of reason, through the excess of subjectivity, that the idea of, an, of a predetermined, prehistoric absolute comes into being in the first place, which is Hegel's play on Kant, which we talked about extensively in the previous two classes. And so instrumental reason has a perverted quality, but it's not the perverted quality of saying, I am the agent of historical determinism, which would be a kind of like vulgar Marxist determinism. Instead, it's about how there is a perversion within the idea of God himself. That God is the person who's saying, I am the vessel of your unfolding. And of course, this is also like the perversion of every parent. A parent who says, I'm no longer a real person. I'm simply the person who creates the conditions for your unfolding as a person. Although secretly we all know that then the parent wants us to say, oh, you're the best parent ever, etc. <laughs> the same is true, the core perversion within the, the philosopher, the teacher, which is to say, Again, I am simply the person who is helping you on your path towards enlightenment and wisdom, etc. That's a properly perverted stance, which is also why no philosopher should ever say this. Because if you're saying that this divine wisdom that I have within my, me is the condition for you to live your best life, at that point, you're a pervert because you've become the instrumental, the instrumental agent of the other person's fulfillment. This is why like a properly philosophical educational stance would be to say, here's what I know, now go screw off and do whatever you will with it. And that's of course also what a parent who isn't perverted does, is a parent says, I brought you into the world, I've sheltered you, but now be your own person. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, this is also why in the Christian event, the crucifixion, God goes from being the perverted God towards the not perverted God. Until then, humanity is simply the process of fulfilling the instrumental reason of God, which is why it's very easy for God in the Old Testament when he gets frustrated with humankind to simply wipe them out and start <laughs> over because th that's what the pervert can do. It's only through when it goes through Christ that, pro that God, in a sense, abdicates his own responsibility for the unfolding of the human community, the faithful, etc. Anyway, that's... I don't want to go on too much of a riff there. So we're already talking about desire. As soon as we talk about cinema and cinema being a pervert's art, we're talking about the fact that cinema is not teaching you what to want, it's teaching you how to want. And, and as soon as we talk about desire, um, there's a couple of examples that Zizek often uses. One of the most common examples, or like frequently used examples that Zizek has, is an example about the Kinder Egg. And the Kinder Egg is a kind of chocolate. Mm -hmm. Have you encountered this? You know, I have. I don't think I have ever myself had a Kinder Egg. But I think the American version of this, I don't know if it still exists, is uh, Cracker Jacks. Cracker which Jack. is like a little box of caramel corn that always comes with a toy. So there's something similar, but still something very different that's working mm. here. And I'll, what you're describing is like the, um, uh, the Happy Meal version of it, mm. essentially, right? It's mm. a bit like a Happy Meal. You buy something, plus you get a toy. It comes in the box. In the box. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's probably similar. That's and it's fine. in the take me out to the ball game song. That's very I great. Some I think first I want to explain the example, and then we can talk about whether the <laughs> cracker, whether it. cracker Carbon jacks are an equivalent. It's really <laughs> applicable. Go for it. This makes no sense to me. I'm not sufficiently American to know what a cracker jack is. Um. Well, actually, before we talk about that, let's talk. Let's let's return to the mm. idea of the pervert for a moment, yeah. because I briefly talked about the fact that. The pervert, one of the things the pervert does is that he feels like there's a division, for example, between truth and lies. And that what the pervert fails to see by saying, I am the instrument of truth, is that the idea of a pure and unadulterated truth is itself the purest lie, as it were. Now, there's something that happens when it comes to over-identification with any political cause. And there's a Zizek anecdote that is quite, quite useful here. Zizek says that when he was growing up um, under what was still then a communist state, 
his experience from the Communist Party, I should say, his experience in the Communist Party was that people weren't really devout communists, that everyone was cynical about communism within the power structure, and that the people who were identified as potential dissidents were precisely the people who over-identified with communism. In other words, the way in which the power structure was perpetuated wasn't by saying we have this like rigid, devout commitment to communism. The way in which the power structure was upheld was saying we're not, none of us really truly believe in it, but we're all participating in it anyway. And so the best thing you could do to be a dissident wasn't to start saying I'm a capitalist Western consumer who wants to undermine communism. The best way to be a dissident was to properly be a communist. <laughs> This would be the most enthusiastic party participant. And Jizek has this great anecdote where he says that he was at a, uh, one of the like leaders of the party was giving a speech to his university. And um, he was uh, essentially sort of vulgarizing Marx. He was saying, you know, the, the, we shouldn't be thinking about the world. We should be changing the world. <laughs> we shouldn't be just sitting on our university benches. <laughs> we should be up and working with the common man. He sort of turned, it, turned that into it. Uh, of course, Marx is uh, the point isn't to think the world, the point is to change it. Of course, this is already a bit of a joke because from a Hegelian perspective, which Marx embraces, thinking the world is changing it. But anyway, and so, so and he misquotes Marx, etc. And he's sort of vulgarizing it. And Zizek says that as a student, he walks up to him later and he says, you claim, don't you know that you misquoted Marx? Don't you know that it was actually thesis 11, not thesis 4, etc. And and the man turns to him and he says, yes, I, of course I know, but that's exactly the point. Now, there's two ways to interpret this story. One, we could say, well, the guy's just covering. He actually doesn't know Marx. He's not like a devout communist in that sense. Or you could also say that there's something much more clever at work here, which is that by misquoting Marx to the students about how they should get to work instead of theorizing, he's proving his own point, which is that there's no point in theorizing because the only person who doesn't take his advice, being Zizek, the person who isn't getting to work, who knows his Marx, is the person who isn't part of the collective. And so there's this, unf I, I hope that's not too confusing. So what, what happens here in a weird way is it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy whereby the whole participation rests on the misinterpretation of the idea of what the collective will is. And, and so again, the, what, what, the, what the Communist Party here properly understands is that the most dangerous person within their ranks is the person who thinks that the word of Marx is truth. Which, which isn't to say that we shouldn't read Marx, et cetera, et cetera, but it's that kind of over-identification with it that contains the dissidents. Mm -hmm. Vice versa, this is also why if we actually make a giant leap towards someone like Karl Popper, who claims that, you know, the foundations of the Enlightenment have to be protected and that truth is a fortress that has to be guarded by the hordes of the untruthful, which is already like a weirdly like racial, ethnic, you know, gates of Vienna being stormed by the, you know, by, by the Turks, etc., by the Ottomans. This very framing of truth as something that exists within the vaulted gates of the Enlightenment that has to be protected from the Persian threat or whatever. I mean, not that the Ottomans are the Persians, but whatever. <laughs> that is itself, of course, the least truthful position. That is the perverted the position. That is the saying, I am the agent of truth. And so what happens is that, and this is something that you really have to see over and over through the works of Zizek and other people like Zizek, is that rather than saying we're anti-enlightenment, they're trying to save the enlightenment from itself because nothing is less true, the true to the enlightenment than saying I am a knight of the enlightenment. In other words, as soon as you interpret the enlightenment, the pursuit of reason, rationality, empiricism, etc., as your vocation, as your you know, divine mission to protect the world from the passions of untruth and religion and, and whatever, at that point, you've essentially canceled out the enlightenment. And so the only way to save the Enlightenment from itself is to point out the properly Hegelian idea that maybe reason is itself the ultimate madness. Now, what does that mean? Why is reason the ultimate madness? From a Hegelian perspective, and this is something that Zizek has argued over and over again, the idea of subjectivity, the idea of consciousness presents a problem. The problem of consciousness, as we talked about last week and the week before, the problem of subjectivity, of individual reason, is that we don't experience reason as reason. We experience reason as judgment. In other words, we're judging according to concepts, what we find around us. Ironically, it's precisely within the cognitive sciences that we find this, quote unquote, proven, 
most people see like, oh, cognitive sciences and like neurosciences as being like, we're going to debunk this abstract philosophy coming from Kant, but nothing could be less true. Think about one of the key lessons of like neuroscience, which is something that Shustak has written about as well, which is that your brain is basically working on autopilot most of the time. Like when you go into a room and you see red chairs and then you go into another room and you see more chairs, your brain is not going to look at all the chairs and decide, are they red or are they green? Your brain is going to take a snapshot and make a judgment on whether or not it's likely that the chairs are red because the chairs were red in the other room as well. This is the famous experiment, like you can see it on YouTube, where there's a group of people dancing and there's like a guy in a gorilla suit in the background mm -hmm. and you don't see the guy in the gorilla suit. Basically, what your brain is doing all the time is your brain is tricking you into being uh, cost efficient, <laughs> as it were. And, and there's, a, there's this is another beautiful like, um, like uh, experiment where um, you flip people's faces upside down, mm. but you make a change to them. So mm -hmm. when you look at the picture of their face upside down, it looks like them. Your, your face, uh, sorry, your, your brain rearranges it so that, oh, that's Kanye West, that's Margaret Thatcher. But then if you flip it, the image is like, Bleh! like totally wrong. So your brain is basically like... Your brain like, is taking shortcuts all the time. Yes. Taking shortcuts all the time. In fact, you have to. I mean, mm -hmm. even if you like, even on the level of memory, this is how it functions, right? Mm -hmm. we, we have false memories all the time. False memories that become constitutive to the very idea of who we think we are. And so the funny thing is it's precisely within neurosciences that we see that the brain is very good at what Hegel called abstract reasoning. And... The irony is, of course, that neuroscientists are always saying, well, now we can prove how, you know, everything works like a machine, how reason is sort of this, like, reason underlies everything, everything can be explained according to electrodes in your head, etc. And in many ways, the exact opposite is true. So the more we know about neurosciences, the more we understand about the way in which the brain works, the more consciousness emerges as this kind of mystery, as this kind of, like, malfunction in the machine. Well, and this is really important in the study of economics because economists are constantly trying to compensate for the fact that their field is not in fact a science, but they would like to be called a science. And so they come up with, you know, theorems and equations to try and um, s make scientific economic reasoning and decision making. But once researchers said, well, let's actually look at behavior behavioral patterns in economic reasoning, then they realize that people are completely irrational and don't conform to economic notions of rationality. And this caused absolutely zero changes in how economics considers rationality. They just say, oh, well, people are irrational, therefore. And if only they followed our models, then they could be properly rational. And vice versa, when the emphasis shifts so strongly towards behavioral economics, now you have, in a sense, the study of people's inability to... Right. There's always something like... Personal responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. I mean, I think there's a lot of ideology that goes into economics mm -hmm. as well. And so what I'm talking about here is the basic, the basic mechanism by which we have... I mean, I got off track on <laughs> economics. Sorry, I feel like... <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. I was thinking about economics. And I was like, no, nah, we don't have time to like fully go into <laughs> no, it. No, no, we don't. That's okay. Um, but if you'd like to teach economics <laughs> class, you're more than invited. I think we would all very much enjoy this. I'm hoping I'm it will happen this year. <laughs> okay, so I want to talk about the Kinder Egg for a moment. Yes. Because that's what we're going to talk about. And, and so Zizek has this idea where he's talking about um, desire, but also making a metaphysical argument where he's talking about the Kinder Egg. And the Kinder Surprise Egg, if you've lived in Europe or grown up in Europe, you'll instantly recognize it. It's essentially a chocolate egg, which isn't just consumed for Easter, by the way. You can buy it year-round. I think it's available in America now, too, but for a long time it mm -hmm. wasn't. And it's essentially a chocolate egg, and inside the egg is a little pod that contains a toy, a little plastic collectible toy. And, and Zizek often uses this as an example for um, a couple of things. First of all, when you eat the candy, the process is that you crack open the chocolate and you get the toy. But as soon as you've opened the toy, you discard the toy and you go back to the original candy. Now, one of the questions here is what did you really want? Did you want the chocolate or did you want the candy? In other words, did you want the thing or did you want the thing that was in the thing? For Zizek, you want neither. Instead, you want 
the process of thinking that there is something beyond the horizon, that there is something more. The same principle holds true when you buy a, like a tube of toothpaste or a can or like a jar of peanut butter that says, this time with 30% more <laughs> peanut butter, this time with 30% more toothpaste. In other words, you're induced to buy the thing because you think that it has extra. When in reality, you're just paying for the size mm -hmm. of this tub. It's not like a tub plus a tub. It's already contained the surplus and the surplus enjoyment is already contained within the tub itself. Of course, this induces you to buy it. On a, on a similar level, we do something on Patreon, which is not unlike that, which mm -hmm. is that you can buy my ebook on Patreon for $25. But... Every time I tell you you can buy my ebook, I usually say, I, I don't always do this, but if I were better, better at marketing, which I'm not, <laughs> I would say, plus you'll get the audiobook for free. Now, strictly speaking, this is untrue. Strictly speaking, you're buying $25 worth of the ebook and the audiobook, plus all the downloads for the classes, etc. But it still functions according to the same underlying psychological psychoanalytic principle, which is that you're more enticed to buy the book, not for what the book is, but because you think you're also getting the audiobook for free. And of course, the natural evolution of this today in our society is that we have these weird uncanny products that are supposedly for free. For example, if I go to AT&T, which is like a cell phone provider here in the United States, it says that the iPhone is now being offered for zero dollars. And it has like a zero on it. Now, there's a difference between zero dollars and free. <laughs> zero dollars means that you get the iPhone, but you pay for the cellular plan. In other words, you're actually paying quite a bit more than if you were just to buy the brick of the iPhone without the plan. Now you're stuck on monthly installments. And so this very idea where the free version of something is the more expensive version is part of that same process. The exact same true the exact same thing is true when it comes to marketing online. Most people say, sign up to my newsletter and you'll get a free ebook. Well, at that point, it's no longer free. At that point, you're giving away your personal information to somebody who wants to have you within their marketing ecosystem so that they can send you advertisements, but you get the ebook, which isn't to say that it's a bad deal. It's just saying that what you want isn't the ebook. What, uh, what you want isn't the sign up. What you want is the thing beyond the signing up. And so you're not just saying, I'm going to give you more of something. Instead, you're giving something dynamically different within the thing itself. This is also the basic difference between the mathematic sublime and the dynamic sublime. The mathematic sublime is to say, I want more of X. I want a continuation of X. I want one plus one plus one. The dynamic sublime is to say something, I want something that goes beyond something else. This is also why the Lacanian motto, the slogan about love, which is... Uh, I love in you what is more you than yourself, and hence I want to destroy you, is, is the dynamic sublime. It's not just saying I like you, and liking you more means I love you, which is of course the failure of how friendship never, I mean, I don't want to say never because people have diversity of experiences, but usually when you're friend zoned, it's not that you are, you get along, and if you get along more, you will become lovers, right? It's not the mathematical sublime. It's not saying we like each other, we like hanging out, and since we like hanging out so much, maybe we should also start doing it and being a couple. <laughs> That's where you get friend zone. Friend zone exists in the mathematical sublime. The dynamic sublime is to say there's a spark that we have for each other, which is simply the opening for something different beyond. I posted a joke about this that, of course, was misinterpreted, which is my fault, but I was talking about, and again, this is something that Zizek talks about as well. I was talking about um, how when, you know this one, when a man and a woman are having sex. I mean, it doesn't have to be a man and a woman, but okay, old-fashioned, you know, <laughs> millennial here. Man and a woman are having sex, and the woman says, more, 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 which is already a performative utterance, right? I mean, it's rare for it to be mm -hmm. the other way around. Certainly, like, if you look at, like, how pornography related to the pervert's art of cinema pornography is not teaching you what to want. In other words, you're not saying the body type of the people you see in pornography is the desirable body type. It's, tell it's telling you how to want, mm -hmm. specifically how to participate in sexual intercourse. This is the funny thing about people who get very excited about pornography and like children watching pornography or, you know, minors. 
they always say, oh, it's going to corrupt the children. Well, actually, it's going to teach them. Now, it may teach them the wrong attitudes towards sex, if there is such a thing as a right attitude, but that's what most, most conservatives fear. It isn't that children are going to be corrupted by watching sex, it's that they're going to learn how to have sex through pornography, which, of course, for the conservative spells corruption. Point aside. Yeah. Are you okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are, were you rolling no, your eyes No, there's so much I'm going to very say. Fast. Yeah, no, there's okay, so, so so within this performative aspect, which is already a little bit like the reenacting of like a <laughs> pornographic exchange, where the woman says more, more, more. Now, when the woman says more, 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 it's the mathematical sublime. I want more of the same because this is wonderful. Whereas the man interprets it as, oh, you're saying more, more, more. Clearly you mean harder, harder, harder. <laughs> Which ironically often becomes the opposite of what was good. <laughs> now, the point here, and this is the point that, of course, I think was missed in my video, which is my fault. The is joke. That, no, no. Is. Oh, what's the yeah. joke? Yeah. No, the joke is the difference between mathematical and exponential. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Which Kant calls dynamic. Yeah, and, thank you. And uh, the thing here is, the point isn't to say that there is a generic difference between man and woman, mm -hmm. that there is a universal substance of man and a universal substance of woman. Instead, in a very Lacanian way, the only universality that exists is difference itself. The only universal is the difference, the misrecognition, the misperception. In other words, that there is no such thing as the proper male response or the proper female response, except as a refracted version of the misinterpretation of what you thought was the absolute male or female response. In other words, what it means to be male is to think that there is such a thing as a genuine female to which you then have the false representation of now I am a male. Vice versa, that the position of female is simply the false, the misrecognition that there is such a thing as universal male. Now, of course, I've done another video about this, but this is also how you can start understanding the patriarchy. If woman is the one who understands that there is no such thing as universal masculinity, as like true manliness, then woman as a survival strategy needs to uphold that idea of the male ego, of the male universal. And by means of sort of cynically upholding it, mm -hmm. you end up being in a position where femininity is cast as a universal submissive substance to the idea of men. And you become trapped in this very repressive cycle, a repressive cycle which we today call patriarchy. I don't know if you did a clip about this after Bell Hooks passed away, but I thought that this was a good insight. And I can't remember what the quote was, but it was the idea that patriarchy as... Um, sort of the disavowal of feminism doesn't emerge, doesn't initially necessarily emerge in the experience of young women, but rather in the experience of young men. That it's about teaching young men what masculinity is as the complete absence of um, attributes that we um, associate with femininity. And that that escalates into um, the denial of feminism. Sorry, that's. Don't that apologize. No, don't <laughs> apologize. No, no. I mean, it's fine. It's just it, the the problem here is that the idea of teaching it. Yeah. The idea that there is some kind of like universal subset of what could be taught about what it means to be the right kind of man or the right kind of woman. As soon as you engage in that kind of level of discourse, you've already fallen prey to the exact problem, which is the belief that there is such a thing as a, as a universal. Mm -hmm. huh? yeah. And so from a Lacanian perspective, the misrecognition, mm -hmm. the difference, is the only universal part itself. And that the whole idea of male and female emerges retroactively as a response to wanting to fill in this mm -hmm. lack. Mm -hmm. And so there's a perversion, not to the sexual intercourse, but there's a perversion to the idea of male and female, which is to say, I am properly embodying the male archetype by means of my body, by means of filling in the gap that exists within the universal itself. And of course, in a literal sense, when you're having sex, you're filling in the gap in the other, mm -hmm. which is mutually related. Now, if we take that back to the Kinder Egg, remember the whole point about the Kinder Egg is that what you're desiring isn't the chocolate, what you're desiring isn't the toy in the chocolate, what you're desiring is the gap within the object itself. What's pleasurable is the split. What's pleasurable isn't just being denied something. After all, if I said, here's a Kinder Egg, but I'm gonna take it away from you, that wouldn't induce you towards any kind of enjoyment. This kind of like classic vulgar Freudian idea that everything, all desire emerges from a sort of primordial loss. No, no, nothing could be less true. The, prim the primordial loss exists already within the object itself. That's the Lacanian insight that he adds to Freud. 
It's not that you have something which is taken away from you. It's that what you want in the thing is the thing that is taken away from it already. In other words, what you want in the thing is that which goes beyond the thing. Now, what goes beyond the thing? It's not just the chocolate versus the toy. It's saying that in a sense, you can never have either. As soon as you have the toy, you want the chocolate. As soon as you have the chocolate, you want the toy. And so what you want is this split, this negativity itself. Now, from a Freudian Lacanian perspective, this negativity is called the death drive. And that's essentially what Zizek's entire philosophical project is, is to say that the death drive wasn't there to begin with. The death drive isn't genetic. The death drive wasn't part of a a priori universal substance. Instead, the death drive is part of the mistake of subjectivity itself. It's part of the, in a sense, evolutionary, um, evolutionary error that is human consciousness. The death drive is that which exists within the thing, which thereby exists within the subject beyond the subject himself. And accounting for this split, sort of this constitutive negativity within consciousness itself, which is mediated through a perceived absence in the object, we can account for something that wasn't there in the first place. It's something that goes beyond just the idea of a universal thing. To bring that back to where we started in the class, this is also the problem of power. Because the problem of power is that it never really started with the powerful thing. This is the entire problem within the Arthurian universe of legend. Within the Arthurian myth, all power can be legitimized by some kind of ur substance of object. You pull the sword out of the stone, and whoever pulls the sword out of the stone is the person who's the righteous heir. That would be the perfect solution. Imagine a democracy in which we didn't have to vote, but instead everybody could just go up to City Hall, and whoever actually fits into the chair gets to be the rightful ruler. The Cinderella. The, it, yeah. the Cinderella thing, exactly. The shoe fits yeah. the thing. The, the hermeneutically sealed world of myth is continued in the Arthurian legend. In this sense, you have to see the Arthurian legend as going completely against the entire Platonic, Socratic, Western metaphysical revolution. It's actually going back to the world of myth. Everything fits. The right person for the right thing. Now, of course, there's a totalitarian element here as well, which is this idea that you were born for X. You were fated to do this thing. And if only we could create a society in which everybody fulfills their most perfect function, then we will have the world of myth, the hermeneutically sealed purpose of humanity where everything is right. This is also why if you go back to the Kinder Egg, there's a totalitarian element within the Kinder Egg, which would be to say, what if, and this is of course the misrecognition, would say, what if we strip away the chocolate to get to the core of the toy? Hmm. The toy is the Arthurian sword, and if we only strip away the excess, we will have the ultimate thing. And that's how you realize the totalitarian element that is transferred from myth back into the Platonic universe. Because in the Platonic Socratic universe, the idea is that we have essence, illusion, the world of appearance, Mm -hmm. the stuff of chocolate that we're all immersed in. And if only we can crack that illusion, we can exit the cave, we'll have essence, substance as such. But of course, it emerges that this again is just the Kinder Egg. You've cracked yourself out of the world of appearance, you found the Kinder Egg, the toy, but the toy contains nothing of essence as such. And so the Lacanian, Zizekian, Hegelian insight is to say, essence only exists within the split, within the split object, which is also another way for saying the subject. That essence isn't behind the world of illusion, that there is no pure you know, enjoyment behind the chocolate of the Kinder Egg. Instead, it's the very sustaining of this gap, Mm -hmm. the imminent gap between the chocolate and between the toy in which essence emerges. Now, from a Lacanian perspective, the essence here is death drive, death drive being the vehicle of subjectivity, subjectivity being that which persists beyond the idea of, you know, teleological completeness of fate. For, sorry, I'm going a bit fast here, but for essentially this this gap from, from a philosophical perspective is precisely also how we release Socrates and Plato from the totalitarian element. Because the totalitarian element within the cave is always to say, as long as we, you know, as long as we can fight our way beyond the world of appearances into the world of essence. Zizek's insight is that once you get there, there is nothing there. The essence lies only in the tension between essence and appearance itself, which isn't Zizek's idea, it's Hegel's idea. Hegel's idea is essentially that substance equals subject. For Lacan, this is that the subject is the bard subject. The subject is literally represented, as I said last week, by the S, by the it, of wo es war soll ich werden, where it was, I will become, where substance was, subject will become. And so we have, again, 
on this level of desire, on the level of perversion, on the level of the toy, on the level of consumption, we have a restaging of what is for Zizek the fundamental problem of philosophy itself, which is the problem of subjectivity. Accounting for the subject and accounting for the idea of consciousness is the key, is the essence. And so subjectivity is the thing that persists not despite the incompleteness of essence, but the thing that persists so as to reenact and stage the completeness of essence in its own incompleteness. Very technical, I know, but like sort of important. Do we want to wrap up on something slightly easier or? Uh, Did I just lose no. you like 10 minutes no, no, ago? No, 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 okay. no, no, no. I'm, I'm there with you. I'm there with you. I was still trying to decide whether Jack in the Box fits the model of the Kinder Egg or Does not. Does it? I'm not sure. For me, I was... I'm, you have to describe yeah, it first. What is a Jack in the Box? It is a box. Uh -huh. No, Cracker Jacks. Cracker Jack. It is a box mm -hmm. that you open and you stick your hand in and you pull out something. And your first question is basically either, can I eat this? Or is this a toy or not? Mm -hmm. And if it's not the toy, you're very disappointed and you have to make it disappear. And so you eat it. And it's sort of sweet and crunchy, but not very satisfying. So, of course, you reach into the box again and you keep sort of hysterically asking Can you not your... look into the box? I mean, not really. Okay, it's a, car it's it's a cardboard like, box. It's a little cardboard box. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so you keep eating the this candy corn until you get to the toy. And then you're sort of satisfied with the toy, but also disappointed. And so it's that same sort of like what I think of what you're talking about is like ping-ponging back and forth between the chocolate and the toy. So, so yes yeah. and no. Okay. Uh, yes and no. First of all, yeah, there's a certain principle that works mm. here. But actually what you're describing is much more, is much closer to the anti-Semitic trope that mm. was popularized during World War II that actually Jared, I think it was Jared Kushner or like one of the Trump children popularized, which was the, there was a bowl, oh. there was a bowl of M&Ms or Smarties or something. And the idea was that if there's one poison, one poisoned M&M, why would I grab into the bowl of M&Ms? As in saying, you know, mm, if there's yeah. one bad egg, it'll ruin everything. You can no longer, if there's one illegal immigrant, you can no longer actually treat everyone as equal because mm -hmm. one of them undermines the rest. The anti-Semitic trope here is that there's these depictions within World War II of like, um, you can't just go foraging for mushrooms because, you know, one of the mushrooms is poisonous. One of the mushrooms is the Jewish mushroom, etc. I mean, hugely anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's always an ironic twist on that when it comes to Halloween, which is that for Halloween, we have these jokes now, which is like, can you believe someone put a razor blade <laughs> inside the candy? But then people have these memes where they say, can you believe someone put the Communist Manifesto inside my candy? And so what you're saying there is that there's an indeterminacy between mm -hmm. the objects. Right. Is it candy? Is it not candy? Yeah rather than the candy sustaining the desire for the toy within right. and then the toy the candy but mm -hmm. it's a very similar principle it's quite mm -hmm. it's quite interesting i think like yeah we should try we should go to a these. baseball game and and have an experiment now what Juzik <laughs> says about the kinder egg yeah. is that he says that part of what the kinder egg does is it actually becomes a metaphor it exposes how all commodities function mm -hmm. within a consumer society which is that the, the the most truthful form of a commodity would be you simply pay for what something is but of course, that's not consumption. Consumption isn't saying I'm paying to get exactly what I'm being promised. The whole point of consuming something, of consumption, is to say I am consuming something which goes beyond the thing that I'm buying, which on the level of fantasy can be the fact that when you purchase something, you're investing in yourself. I am buying clothing because I want to look good in clothing or whatever. It's also why Zizek says that he, the most vulgar thing is to buy clothing for yourself. Because when you buy clothing for yourself, you're imagining yourself as you might be perceived by other people. In other words, you're saying, what would I look like if I wanted to be desired by the other? Mm -hmm. And the pervert's position, of course, is always the other way around. The pervert's position is to say, I am the fashion police. And as the representative of the fashion police, <laughs> I embody the higher <laughs> form of fashion. You know what I mean? Like, I am a fashion. Mm -hmm. and, and so what happens here with consumption is you're not buying the thing. You're buying essentially the thing that goes beyond the thing. And here we're at the level of fantasy. And for Lacan, the basic deadlock of all subjectivity is that you can't love somebody for who they are. You can't even love yourself for who you are. You can only love other people for something you think exists in them beyond themselves. And that's what you want to destroy or consume. In the same way that love isn't saying, 
oh, I love you because you have X qualities that I'm investing in. You know, this is the most vulgar thing when you bring your girlfriend home and a parent says she has very wide hips, so she's good for raising <laughs> children. That would be considered the opposite of love, right? Mm-hmm. That would be an anti-romantic gesture par excellence. You go out to a cafe mm-hmm. and you say something like, well, I like the color of your eyes, which I'd like to pass on to my children. But most of all, I think that you have very good hips for bearing children. As soon as you, bec- as soon as you make it about the exchange, mm-hmm. it becomes the... You know, I'm paying to do X. I'm, there's a there's a there's something very vulgar in, in the transactional quality. Mm-hmm. The beauty and also the pain of consumption is that you're buying the inexplicable X, the thing that is in the thing beyond itself. This car is a storytelling machine, a vehicle of getting towards a new life. Mm-hmm. This this you know these clothing will make me whatever. Like you're investing in not the thing, you're investing in a fantasy beyond the thing. And, and for Lacan, that's exactly how love works. Love is essentially a consumer process, not because you're rationally choosing between different options, but because you're, in a sense, irrationally investing in somebody beyond what they seem to promise you. You don't say, oh, I know exactly who you are, therefore I love you and we will spend the rest of our life together. It's the exact other way around. I love something in you that exists beyond yourself, something that you can't even see in yourself. That's what I'm committed to. So the point here, and we're going to develop this in the remaining two classes because we have two more classes and we've already gone beyond an hour. The point here is that for Zizek, the split in the object isn't a split between two things. It's an imminence to the thing itself. And that the split in the object can be mirrored within the split in the subject. The subject isn't split between two things. Difference is the only universal thing in the subject itself. Subject equals difference. For Zizek, that also is then related from object to subject, how we can understand the gap between essence and appearance. It's not essence versus appearance. It's the idea that essence and appearance in their imminent split emerge themselves. And that is Zizek's sort of teleological project, which he calls essentially applying the principle of death drive towards the ontological approach of Hegel and Kant. Now, we have two more weeks to talk about this. We have two more weeks until we finish the series called The Vanishing Mediator, on Zizek, Hegel, Kant, and Lacan. Then it's going to be coming out as a book. Until then, you can read my book, The Hermeneutic Temptation, on Patreon, exclusively on Patreon. If you'd like to read my book, if you'd like to catch up with all these classes, you can find all that on Patreon. Uh, This time with 30% more. (laughs) And um, so if you'd like to join that, please do take a look at our Patreon. There's a link in my bio. Until then, <laughs> thank you guys so much for joining us today. It's been yes. my absolute pleasure, our mm-hmm. pleasure. Yeah, indeed. Thank you for making this such a familial <laughs> environment. I really enjoy that. Thank you for vibing with us. Yeah, of course. We're going to be taking a five-minute break, and then we're going to answer your questions live on Discord. Mm-hmm. So if you'd like to join on Discord as part of our first tier, our $5 tier on Patreon, we're going to go live in five minutes. We're also going to record the Q&A as a podcast, which we're going to release exclusively to our patrons. On that note, Thank you guys so much. Greetings, salutations, and love to everyone around the world. We shall see you guys next week. Bye-bye.